great head start that we've had uh, to online streaming so far. Uh, but we're glad that you're here. Uh, we're going to have a blast tonight. We've got Brother Paul Wilson back with us. The Sharon Wilson back with us. We're glad to have you all. And glad to have you back from uh, the hospital and uh, everywhere that y'all been. And doctor's offices and all that kind of good stuff. Welcome back. Uh, you got to stay home this week. Well, good. I'm glad. That's good. Amen. Hallelujah. And we also have Miss Thomas back. Miss Thomas back with us. Yes. Oh, sorry, you over there. We have Brother Phil on the organ over there. And so uh, we're going to have a blast tonight. And uh, we want you all to have a blast with us. So Brother Larry's going to come. Before we do that, we're going to have a word of prayer. And Brother Larry's going to come on down. So let's pray. And uh, then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence. We are so glad to be here today. We're glad, Lord, that uh, we're able to gather in your house. Father, we know that uh, there's so many people that are not able to uh, come to church, and so uh, we're glad that we're able to both uh, do both things. We're able to gather in your house as your church, and that we're able to stream this service so that uh, folks who are not able to gather uh, can see this this uh, this service and uh, enjoy the, the things that we're doing. Father, we just want to thank you for the ability you have given us to speak the ability you've given us to read, uh, the ability you've given us to sing, the ability you've given us to worship in all those different ways. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, as we do these things, that we would do everything that we do uh, in honor and glory to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Brother Larry. Take 473, Larry. We don't know if we're serving by Let's try 473. Page 473. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. 
study, so uh, we'll just do that, and I'm going to ask Brother Frank Diamond, if you would, to word our prayer. So, um, if you know me a little bit, you know that I like history. And I like uh, history where history interacts with the church. It's one of my favorite things to have. And so tonight I found a little illustration to help us get started. Because we're talking about the blessing of brotherhood. And uh, 
could also be called the blessing of unity. So during World War II, Hitler decided it would be a good idea for all churches to be one. And so he commanded that that would be so, and it was so. So there were some folks who thought that that was okay, and they went along with it, and some folks who didn't think that that was a good idea, and they didn't. And this was particularly true among uh, the folks that were called the Brethren. And so about, it's about a 50-50 split between those who decided it would be a good deal and went along with Hitler, and those who didn't think it would be a good idea and did not go along with Hitler. Of course, you know that those folks did not go along with Hitler, then he put them in concentration, concentration uh, camps, and uh, some of them died there. And so when the war was over, then the churches got back together, and there were quite bitter feelings between those who had uh, sympathized with the Nazis and those who had died in the concentration camps, or those who survived, actually survived the, the camps. And so they came together after the war, and they spent several weeks just together and praying. And after they prayed and examined their own hearts in the light of Christ's commandments, uh, there was a guy named Francis Sh uh, Shaver who uh, told of the event, who had a friend who was there, and they asked, what did you do? And he said, we were just one. We, we realized that even though we had gone through all that we had gone through, that Christ was still in control of our lives, and that the Holy Spirit created a sense of unity in us, and we were able to be healed without words. Yeah. And so I thought that was shocking. <clears throat> he also went on to say that love filled their hearts and dissolved their hatred. Now, the love prevails among believers, especially in times of strong disagreement, it presents to the world an indisputable mark of a true follower of Jesus Christ. So that's what I want us to be thinking about tonight. We're going to start out by talking about the brotherhood of man. Now, when we talk about the brotherhood, the brotherhood of man, we have to be very careful. And the reason why I have to be very careful is because we talk about the brotherhood of man and the fact that all of us have a common father, people tend to take that particular state and say, since everybody is in the brotherhood of man and everybody has a common father, we're all going to the same spot and that nothing could be further from the truth than that. And so what I want to do is just talk about a couple of things that we find in the Bible that demonstrate that all of us have a common father but not all of us are going to the same spot. So number one, we find in Proverbs 22 that the rich and poor have this in common, that the Lord is the maker of us all. Now we can all say amen to that, right? Amen. Lord, Lord makes us all. But we can also find this in Malachi chapter 2, which is also an Old Testament uh, book. It says, have we not all one father? Now, when we find that in the Old Testament, what makes that different than finding it in the New Testament? If Malachi says, have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another by fulfilling the covenant of our fathers? Who is Malachi speaking to? He's speaking to just one group. And that group is Jewish believers. Jewish believers. So we cannot rip that out of the context of the Old Testament and say, we all have one father, and we're all going to the same spot. No, we're not. Because we're not Jewish. Now, we can say, without qualification, that we all have the same maker. We can say, without, without qualification, that we have the same father. But folks, listen to me. There's a whole difference between having the same father and being related to him 
by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a whole big, that's a whole other story. Now, we find something else that's equally compelling and interesting in Acts chapter 17. And here's what it says. And, and we, we need to get this message out today more than ever. It says, He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. God has made of every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl one blood. We are the same inside. God has made us the same. And so because God has made us the same, we cannot look at someone who is different externally or who is different ethnically or who is different uh, gender-wise and say, because you are a different skin tone or you, have, you were born in a different place or you're not a man or you're not a woman, you're not the same as me. Guess what? God's Word says He has made us all of one blood. All of one blood. And so when folks begin to start out with, well, I'm a blank. You fill in the blank. Christian. You know what you just did? You just stepped in. Because when you qualify what kind of Christian you are, then you messed up. Or if you qualify what kind of person you are, you just messed up. Because God says that we are all of one blood. We're all the same. And we can't say one life matters more than another life. Because in the eyes of God, He created us all the same. So if anybody ever wants to talk to you about whatever, one life matters or another life matters, Here's a verse of scripture you can whip out and say, here, look, see what God says about this. Acts 17, 26, you might want to write that down. Acts 17, 26. Believe it or not, we were having this conversation in my office Monday or Tuesday. And we were talking about Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, not White Lives Matter, but All Lives Matter. Uh, and, and, and when you say, when you qualify, something, Lives Matter, then the, the, we have to have we have to have this conversation and say if we get back to where God started this thing, then He said we're all made from the same blood. We're all one blood. Now that ties right into this next thing, which God forbids harsh judgment. God forbids harsh. Listen, you cannot have a brotherhood if you've got somebody that's walking around with a big stick, whacking people. Can I get an amen? amen. No amens? Amen. You can't have fellowship if somebody's walking around beating you dead. You cannot have fellowship if you're afraid to speak because you're afraid that somebody's going to jump down your throat because you say something. You cannot have fellowship with somebody that's walking around that's going to judge you because of who you are or what you do. Now, we should be the kind of people that the Apostle Paul was. Because the Apostle Paul was the kind of person that said, look, does eating meat offend you? Most of us would say, you know what, if eating meat, if me eating meat offends you, don't watch. <laughs> That's what we would say. I'm not giving up meat for you. What did Paul say? If eating meat offends my brother, I'll eat no meat as long as the world is. That's what he said. But we say, you know, if you don't like what I do or what I say or the way I dress, don't look. Leave me alone. Step out. So let's review this section. God is the universal father of all mankind. As the universal father of all mankind, he has created us all with the same blood. As such, 
there should be a kinship with all mankind. I want y'all to think about this for a second. Let's just say that there are a thousand cows in the pasture somewhere. Some are brown, some are white, some are red. You can't have green ones, but you know, some are red, some are spotted, some got big humps on their back. You know what I'm talking about? Now you think the cow's gonna look at another cow and go, oh, you got a hump on your back. I'm not I'm not fellowship with you. Or you think that a cow's gonna look at another cow and go, oh, you're brown. Well, you know, I'm black. So I'm not fellowship with you. Or whatever. Cow. Cow's a cow. You know what we should do? We should say, I'm a people. So I'm not, I'm not gonna look at other people as anything other than a people. You're a people, I'm a people. That's, that's good enough for me. And we should have kinship with all mankind. And I'm going to tell you something that we, that we fail to do. After World War II, I was just talking about World War II. After World War II, the defeat of Japan was taken over by the United States temporarily. It wasn't, it wasn't a long-term deal. We knew it was a long-term deal. We could go in here just... With the, with the idea that we were going to make Japan one of the states of the United States. We just didn't do that. We knew that we had defeated them. We knew that we were going to build it back up. But we went in there and we gave them American democracy. And they loved it. To this day, Japan is a democracy. Another thing that we did in Japan was we went in there with the American heave ho, gung ho, let's get her done attitude, capitalism. And today, Japan is one of the greatest capitalist states in the world. You know what we failed to do? We didn't send 10,000 missionaries over there. Right. And today, Japan is still Buddhist. Very few Christians. I wish that we had sent 10,000 missionaries. We did send a couple. Um, how many of y'all know who Jacob the Shader is? You don't, you don't know who he is. But if, when I tell you this story, you would know it. In 1942, Japan had handed it to us. I don't be made. I mean, they, they bombed Pearl Harbor. They were taking over. Philippines, they were taking over away, they were taking over everything you can think of. They were just, they were on the verge of taking over Australia. And the United States thought, we've got to do something. And so they put 16 medium bombers on a carrier. That, those things can't come back to the carrier. Once they leave, they're gone. <coughs> and so they stripped them down, they, put it, they didn't have any guns on them. They just had a few bombs. That's all they had. And Jimmy Doolittle led that raid. Now, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right. So, Jacob the Shazer, the Shazer, was in one of those airplanes. And I forget now if he was a navigator or bomber or whatever. But he was one. He was in one of those airplanes. None of those planes made it back. One of those planes landed in Russia. One of them landed in Sweden, I think, or some Switzerland. But the rest of them crashed somewhere and got shot down. Jacob Shader was one of the few guys that got taken captive by the Japanese. And he hated them so much he wanted to kill them. Literally just, he wanted to kill them. And one day somebody gave him, guess what? You two Gideon sitting back there. Gave him a Gideon New Testament. And they let him read it for a couple days. And then they beat the fool out of him for being able to read that thing. And every time they would give it to him, they would beat the fool out of him. And one day, he got saved. And he made this promise to God. God, if you get me through this, when this war is over, I'm coming back to Japan. And 
I'm going to be a witness and a missionary to these people. And he did. You know who he led to the Lord? I can't say this dude's name. But he led to the Lord. I think his name is Mitsuni Peshuda. If that's close enough. But he was the guy that led the raid on Pearl Harbor. Shocking. That's how God does stuff. That's what happens when you don't look at somebody as you just these terrible names that we come up with. We have kinship for all mankind. And then we sacrifice our own desires for what God has for us. Now, the second thing that I want to talk about tonight is that brotherly love should be the rule and not the exception in the church and everywhere else. Right. So, Paul said that we ought to honor one another. Honor one another. And there's a, I've got 7, 8, 9, 10, 14, well, I don't have any of that. I'm just messing with y'all. I've got a, bu a bunch of one another's. Let's just, I'm just, let me just talk to you about it. But honor one another. Lift one another up. You know, I think if we did that in church and then took that home and did it at home, honor one another. If somebody says something to you and you want to go, then just, just take that breath and go. Let's, let, let, let's, let's talk about that person. You know what you just did? You just honor that person. Because instead of yelling at the person that you're fixing to yell at, you thought about it for a second. And instead of demeaning them, yelling at them, arguing with them, you decided to honor them. And that's what the Lord wants us to do. And the second point plays right into that same one, and it is that we're supposed to love one another. Anybody want to go, duh? Well, duh, Brother David, yeah. Jesus loved us, so we're supposed to love one another. Love him, love one another. So, 1 Corinthians 13, y'all don't know what that one is, do you? Yes, love you. Love suffers long, it's kind. Love is not envy. Love is not great stuff. It's not puffed up. We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to be kind to one another. Y'all know what? This sermon is just killing me. <laughs> I'm talking about just killing me. Because the, the Lord is just beating me on the head right now. We're supposed to be kindly affectionate to one another. We're supposed to care for one another. We're supposed to exemplify the spirit of Christ. We're supposed to be godly. So, what the world needs now, let me, let me read it. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's telling love. I got the, the, the timing off on that one. So what does the world need now? Love? No. What the church needs is to teach the world how to love. Because love doesn't happen in the back of the 57 children. A lot of people think that that's the way it works. Y'all said, y'all are saying, Brother David, how long have you had that sermon? <laughs> we need to teach the world how to love. Amen. So my last point is the unity believers. We cannot be unified if we are not in Christ. So you remember that beautiful song that we read? And how all that imagery of, 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 uh, of Aaron being anointed. You know, if you've never been ordained or if you've never been lost to preach or anything like that, you don't realize how, how humbling it is when you're standing or sitting in front of the church. And particularly, one, one that got me the most and gets me every time that we do an ordination service is when we lay hands on the person who's being ordained. My gosh, uh, when my father put his hands on me and he spoke to me, I, I, I didn't think I'd ever stop crying. I, I just, I was weak. Because, and I don't even really say I, You know, I should, I should, I, I should remember when my dad said to me on the day of my ordination, there were so many things 
chat in that day, because Karen, I was just like, I mean, so many things. Really, it's, it's, it's amazing. But we should be two things that unify and that humble. We should, we should have the same humility that Jesus had. Now, can you think, just for a second, how in the world is, how, how did Jesus accomplish that? How was he humble? That's the most powerful person in the universe. How could he be humble? He had those knot-headed apostles. How could he be humble? He had all those people coming up to him wanting something from him. How could he be humble? Every time he turned around, he had the Pharisees in his face. How could he be humble? I don't know. <laughs> he just, but I want to be part of that. I want to be part of a unified body of Christ. And I want to be part of Jesus. Now, the apostles also exhorted us to be unified. Now, I remember the church of Corinth talking about some not heads. Poor Paul, you know, he planted that church and then he comes, <laughs> comes around and he, he writes them. And, and listen, listen to 1 Corinthians 1.10. He says, Now I plead to you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same, same judgment. Now fast forward to chapter 11. You know what he said? He said, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I partly believe it. You know why? Because there were. There were divisions among them. There shouldn't have been. But there were. And you know what? Things haven't changed a whole lot in the last 2,000 years in regard to the church. There are still divisions among us that shouldn't be. You know, we shouldn't be divided, male and female. That, that shouldn't be a thing. We shouldn't be divided, young and old. I mean, the young, we couldn't, we shouldn't look at the young, like the, let's just say the young adults, and say, man, look at those kids. Man, you know, they're, they're doing everything wrong. Every, turn around and, and they won't do this, and they won't do that, and they won't do the other thing. Meantime, the kids look at us and God, I hope I'm not like that when I get old. <laughs> <laughs> and we should not be divided like that. We should be united. That's what the Lord is, is wants for us. Now, Paul writes the church of Corinth again and, and, and pleads with them again to be united. This is second, the second letter and possibly the third letter. We're, there's, there's an indication that there might have been a second letter that got lost. So Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 13, 11, he said, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Boy, you talk about a good verse. Uh, there's another good verse I'm thinking about. You know, uh, it doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while it does, that we find something that is so good in the Word of God that we wonder, why doesn't everybody know this? So, how many of you have, like, read the Bible and gone, yeah, I've been reading Leviticus, I it doesn't float my boat. Hey, I'll, I'll confess it. I'll tell you. you know, I mean, I'll be reading that and it's like, I'm reading it because it's there and I need to read it. I need to know what it says. It's not doing much for me. I'm seriously not doing much for any spiritual. Like, and then there was a way to run across it. Wow. So what, what would you do if I told you that there's a scripture in the Bible where God himself speaks and he tells you what he expects you? Would you want to know where it was? Would you want to hear it? Listen. In, in uh, Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. 
And, and there's really more to this than just this verse, but this, this verse encapsulates it. It says, he has shown you, old man, and by the way, don't get hung up on that. Remember what I just talked about? We just talked about this gender thing, right? Don't worry about the gender. He says, he has shown you, old man and old woman. Uh, well, that sounded bad. <laughs> he has shown you, old man, what is good for what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? Three things. But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk only before your God. What have we just been talking about? We have just been talking about humility, and there it is in Micah. Now, you're going to say, well, Brother David, you left in Micah. It doesn't, it doesn't pertain to us. To which I would respond, hello. Yes, it does. A whole lot. Whole lot. So let's do this. We do two things. First of all, I want to break this down uh, in conclusion, and then I have a I have a, an illustration for you. So we need to make sure that we live a life that has all the marks and hallmarks of true religion. And I'm not talking about the blue jeans. I'm talking about the real deal. And listen, we, we, we Baptists don't like the word religion too much. You know why? It's because we prefer Christianity. <clears throat> if you ask me, what are you? I'm, saying, I'm, I'm a Christian. Well, where do you go to church? I go to Baptist church. But I'm a Christian first. Not a Baptist first, I'm a Christian first. And so we need to make sure that all the marks and hallmarks of true religion exist in us. Old things have passed away. Old differences forgotten. Harmony among the leaders and the laity. And I, I, want, to, I want y'all to listen to me very carefully. I say this. I use those two terms very loosely because I don't like them. But so that you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I had a preacher one time tell me, he said, you know, you're a preacher. I know. He said, well, you know, as preachers, we can't, we can't hang out with the church members. <laughs> what? He said, well, you're a preacher. So we're clergy and they're laity. We're the, we're the leaders. They're the sheep. I got away from him pretty quick. Because I don't believe that. Because, you know, what were you talking about? Fake, phony divisions. And that's one of them. Let me prove my point to you. What did Peter do when he got out of jail? Did he go find the apostles? No. He went to John Mark's house. He knocked on the door. Brother went sailing up to the door, opened the door. There's Peter, and he said, let me in. She slams the door in his face and goes back over and says, Peter's at the door. And they said, you're crazy. And she said, no, he's at the door. And so that must be his spirit. He's in jail. You know what's funny about that? They've been praying for him to get out of jail. <laughs> he gets out of jail. Says, oh, he can't be out of jail. Well, that's what you were praying for, wasn't it? Yeah. So he's out of jail. So harmony among the leaders of the laity. Everyone gathered into one fold. Do you remember that Jesus said that he had other sheep and other folds? And here's what I think that Jesus was saying. He said, look, and this happened not just one time, but there was another time where the disciples came to Jesus and said, hey, there's a guy over there. He's casting out the demon in your name. Should we forbid him? Should we stop him? <laughs> you gotta just, this is one of those things. I was telling you about a while ago. You just have to, you have to laugh because Jesus is dealing with these guys 24-7. And they're doing this kind of stuff to him all the time. Said, Look, if they're not against us, they're for us. Leave that guy alone. And that's what he's saying here. Listen, after the church in Jerusalem got blown up. And they went their separate ways. What did they do? Here's a church. There's a church. There's a church. There's a church. There are churches everywhere. There are churches. There are sheep 
that are not of that fold. So that's what he was talking about, I believe. And then the last, the last thing is all causes of separation are removed both in Christ and by Christ. So in a Peanuts cartoon, Lucy walks up to Linus and demands that he change the TV channel. And he asked her why. And she just held up her fist like this. <laughs> and so Linus asked, what makes you think you have the right to walk up here and just take over? And she said, these five figures, individually, they're nothing. But when I hold them together like this, they're a weapon that's marvelous to behold. <laughs> the last pain. Linus is looking at his hands, why can't you guys do that? <laughs> What's this? Unity. What's this? Disunity. So that's the difference. So, you know, I'm not saying you'll pummel somebody with your fist. Eh? Please don't take that away from this uh, Bible study. What I am saying is that we should be united. We should be like Aaron. Wow. Just read that again. It just, it just rolls. All right. We're going to pray again. Brother Paul, do you feel strong enough to pray? Oh, yeah. All right. So let's just, I don't know that y'all stay seated. And Brother Paul's going to pray. And then that will be our dismissal. Brother Larry's going to come and I guess sing our song. Okay. Dear God, I want to thank you for the privilege and the honor we have of being able to gathered in your house tonight. Amen. Lord, I can truly agree with what Brother David has said tonight. If we as your people would truly unite like we should and we demonstrate the love that you showed to us, to the world, dear God, that we could impact the world and we could make the changes that are necessary that there will be those who would come to know your Son as our Lord and Savior. Lord, I truly pray that we become a church like that, that we are united behind you doing what you would have us to do, going forth and sharing the good news. I ask that you do with all the ones that are not feeling well, dear God, just reach out and touch their bodies, heal their bodies, allow them to restore back, be restored and be able to come back and join us as we yes. worship you. We just thank you for how you bless us more than we deserve. All this I ask in Christ's name.